to the bathroom. It's my pleasure to introduce Ashish Agarwal. He will talk about functional programming and biology. Go ahead. Thank you. Is that on now? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. Uh, great. Thanks to everyone for making it back from lunch on time. Um, and so this is in full screen mode. Great. So, uh, yeah, the title of my talk is uh, Functional Big Data Genomics. Um, I'll start by just giving a quick overview of um, some general trends in the field of uh, biology. And then we'll talk about the system we're building at uh, New York University uh, to handle uh, this kind of data. So um, the big data trend in biology, you can roughly um, say, started um, in 2000 uh, when the human genome uh, was sequenced for the first time. And there were two major publications on that in Science and Nature. And there's a really massive undertaking. Um, the announcements were made by the you know, President of the United States and Britain. And it, it, it was a scientific uh, result that was really uh, monumental in, in, it's fair to say, the whole history of science. Um, the number of people that were involved in this project is tremendous. That's the author list for the two papers that I was showing you earlier. Um, it cost, um, you know, it took about eight years and $3 billion to sequence this genome one time. Um, but that is changing dramatically fast. Now, in our facility at NYU, we can do the exact same thing in about 10 days for $10,000. So, um, this plot shows us um, the very familiar Moore's Law that, we're, that we have from computer science, in which we're showing um, the cost of disk storage um, over time. And this is, a, this is a log plot. I'm looking for my pointer. There we go. This is a log plot. And so we can see this is an exponential increase. So we know the doubling time for how much storage you can get per dollar is about 14 months. Um, similarly, I'm showing the amount of sequencing you can do, the number of base pairs you can sequence per dollar over time. And there were sort of two phases. There was sort of pre-next-gen sequencing. Um, even at that time, it was exponential. But then, um, after uh, uh, the early 2000s, some new technologies that uh, came into play that are so-called next-gen sequencing technologies. And the double time is now about five months. So what we can see is that the amount of data that's being generated in biology is uh, dramatically higher than what Moore's Law for hard drives can possibly keep up with. Um, Aside from the um, amount of data, it's also important to understand sort of what the analysis techniques and um, other costs are associated uh, in this field. So this was sort of an interesting paper where um, some researchers tried to uh, evaluate how much time um, the average sequencing project takes and what those uh, what that time is spent on. So the red indicates uh, the amount of time spent on experimental design. Um, and the blue is uh, doing the actual sequencing, which remember in 2000 to eight years, right? Now it takes 10 days. Um, and then there's a bunch of data management tasks you have to do. And then there's so-called downstream analysis, um, which is you know, actually understanding your data and getting some meaningful conclusions out of it, right? So in the pre-NGS days, basically doing the sequencing was the hard part. It's what took up most of your time and most of your money. Um, and now that's um, a lot less, and in the future we expect sequencing to basically be a negligible component um, in terms of time and cost. We'll be able to do it really fast and for a very small amount of money, and all the hard work is in doing analysis. So in other words, computer scientists are becoming literally more and more relevant to biology. So um, I'm going to describe our uh, software at NYU that we built to handle this uh, uh, this kind of uh, work. Uh, we've built our entire computational stack in OCaml uh, that includes um, the website uh, that we use for uh, providing our results to our end users, the analysis pipeline, and the lib system, which is a laboratory information management system. Systems infrastructure is not quite doing OCaml, um, but mostly that's being handled sort of by outsourcing, so we haven't needed to do any of it. But if we did, we would probably write that code in OCaml too. Um, this is a rough uh, overview of the software architecture for the application we have. Um, and uh, basically, we have a web interface where clients can log into our website. And we, the web server interacts with an application server, which launches <coughs> jobs um, by queuing them up onto our high performance compute cluster. And we have a lot of data. Um, this single sequencing machine we have in our facility, um, as a result of that, we generate about, on average, 0.8 terabytes of data. 
So this is sort of a conceptual overview of the whole system. Um, basically, wet lab technicians um, submit samples to our facility. This is a picture of the DNA sequencer. Uh, this sequencer is the iSeq 2000. It costs about $700,000, and it costs about a million dollars per year to operate. Um, the sequencer writes data directly to local storage, which we then transfer to a um, separate cluster that's about a mile away, uh, where our big storage and uh, compute nodes are. Uh, we do a bunch of different uh, analysis on that. We present results on the website, and uh, professors and computation biologists can access the results in a variety of ways. And they are also the bioinformaticians do a lot of the analysis themselves, so they log into the computer. So um, first of all, as you can see, um, we're, this is not an academic project, um, although we're at the university. This is really more like a small business. Um, we have customers, although we don't call them that, um, and we charge them a certain price, and we're expected to give them a certain result for each sample that they give us, right? So um, one point to note is that big data is not just big. It's sort of a misnomer. Um, the volume of data is certainly uh, very relevant. Um, but the other complexity that arises when you're dealing with big data is that you end up having a large variety of data, right? You just got the exact same data type over and over and over again. Um, the kind of challenge you would have would be very different. It's like, yes, you'd have to buy more hard drives, you'd have to buy more compute nodes, and maybe you'd want to figure out how to make your algorithms faster. But that's not really the only issue, and it's not the main one that we're addressing. The one that we're really working on is variety. When you have big data, you end up having a lot of different types of data, right? Our facility services, 40 different labs, we have you know, many users, all of whom are doing a wide range of experiments, so we need different data types to represent the information that they like to store. We need to support you know, tens or hundreds of algorithms that they like to use. Um, velocity is also the other property that um, people often refer to when dealing with big data. You're getting data at a very fast rate. That currently is not a challenge in um, biology, although um, due to new sequencing technologies that are coming out, that could very soon become a problem too. So to manage complexity, um, that's sort of the main uh, issue we're addressing. Um, the issue is really, uh, you know, to have a nice framework in, a, in which we can represent all this different type of information. So uh, being programming engineers and function programmers, um, uh, this is the types of our DSL. And um, is that even five minutes left? So the types of our DSL are quite simple. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the data types are quite straightforward. The only uh, really interesting ones are, you know, we have a function type, and uh, since we're dealing with so many files, we've kind of um, uh, provided an explicit type that represents uh, file system objects. So that gives us more precise control over um, keeping track of our millions of files. Uh, we, use a, we use a compiler to do a lot of things. We generate SQL scripts. We generate thousands of lines of little camel code. Uh, which gives us nice strongly typed uh, database uh, read and insert operations. We generate some of our web widgets automatically, and we generate some of the figures in the stock too. A uh, quick example um, of a program in our DSL to represent a sample, a biological sample. Uh, we'd like to give the sample a name. We'd like to know what organism it comes from sometimes. Sometimes the uh, end users don't tell us. And we'd like to give it a note. Um, and a graphic representation of, uh, of that kind of schema in our language is shown here. Uh, compared to SQL, you know, we can have some records, right? This record can point to another record. Um, and uh, this is a distinctly different kind of object. It's not just a table. We, we know that this is a file, right? Um, more complex scenarios are the function types, where we can take some kind of input to a function, which generates a different kind of value. And um, in this case, uh, the return value of this function is uh, the same as the input type. Right? And so this just gives us a little bit higher level understanding of the fact that we're dealing with functions. Um, and uh, this is a graphic representation of a program in our DSL. And this is the SQL schema that gets automatically generated. Um, a picture of the entire DSL that actually represents all the metadata we're storing is here in our language. And this is the auto generated SQL schema. Um, a couple points on the um, main features are the file system. So the benefit of that is that uh, oftentimes files are validated, but oftentimes their files are generated from external tools. Um, and the amount of storage, uh, the storage is often more expensive than compute time. So by having this encoded in our DSL, we don't actually have to think of uh, 
the files as physical objects on a hard drive. We can think of them more abstractly and sometimes delete them and regenerate them when they're requested. Um, it also lets us encode some more specific properties of files. Specific biological data formats that have very variations in them, such, how, such as how some integer score is uh, encoded. And the end user doesn't have to worry about that. We keep track of that in our, so, you know, our little virtual file system and always present the results to them in a uniform way. Uh, function values are the, sort of the hard one, but um, just to be clear, we're not actually supporting a general function. Right? We don't, we can't actually, the end user can't actually uh, define a lambda. We provide some hard coded functions, which are very hard to implement because. They're all um, system calls to some much more complex tool that takes hours to run on some computer network. So the implementation is where the hard work is actually. Um, we have to account for failures, um, time lags, and we have to think about how to serialize the result of these values that we keep the value around. And, um, um, and we, we consider failures and these time lags and serialization issues to be sort of at the meta level, right? The, in the DSL, we assume that the function just returns a normal, simple value. Uh, this is just a screenshot of our website. Uh, we let users log in and uh, look at some variety of information, give them some nice plots uh, that they care about uh, to understand the quality of the results they're getting. Um, we get some auto-generated um, admin interfaces, which let uh, users click on links to modify their own information, and we can do other things like add new users. Um, data migrations is one thing that we felt has been substantially helped by uh, the DSL approach. Uh, we basically need to define one function, uh, which is an S expression conversion to another S expression, representing the two different um, uh, data models that we're using from one version to the next. And given that we do that, um, all these functions, just, uh, we just run the sequence of operations where we dump our metadata into a file, we run the migrator, wipe out our whole database, upload the new one, and uh, this has been surprisingly easy to do, and I think data migration is usually a lot harder. We just do them every other day without a problem. Uh, so OCaml, a little bit of uh, just experience report on OCaml. It has a lot of libraries. Uh, we've been quite happy um, and haven't felt uh, a significant deficiency in that space. Um, we use a lot of them for the OCaml programmers in the room. These are uh, just some of the libraries that we critically depend on. And Oxygen is uh, especially nice for the web programming framework, which is, uh, which is new and has been, has been really nice. Um, and as a result, uh, we were able to use OCaml sort of across our application. Right? When we make a change to our database schema, we get a compile error telling us that some web page isn't going to work correctly. And that's quite nice. I'm not claiming that that's a good general purpose um, thing. I certainly appreciate that different languages should be used at different levels when appropriate. But in a small team setting like the one we have, where it's just uh, like one and a half programmers, um, having one tools chain is, is really helpful. Um, so experience with OCaml. Um, it's, the good parts are that I think the libraries are very good, they're very strong. Um, it's industrial strength that uh, we heard from Iran. We know that it can be used in a high-performance setting, which is critical to us. Um, it's hackable. If you really have to do something, you can just hack it. We, we can understand the compiler. We can go in and modify things if we need to. Um, and the option to be unsafe kind of makes me feel a little safe. We don't like to be unsafe. We actually don't like exceptions. Um, and we uh, always use an error moment. Um, but the fact that it can be unsafe, just makes me feel good. Um, excellent performance, right? We've never really had problems with performance. Um, but certainly it could be better. Um, I think uh, one of the things that could be better is public relations. Uh, it's just not marketed yet as well. We don't, the account community itself often can't find the tools um, that we know exist. Um, the build system is a little complicated. There isn't sort of a blessed set of libraries. There's always like three options for everything you want to do. Um, and, uh, but, but happily, uh, yesterday's panel uh, users and developers meeting, those first three points are all being addressed. Um, so I think that's actually great. Um, and certainly we could use more libraries. So a uh, couple of quick notes on functional programming and biology. Um, how do we get there? So I, I'm a programming linguist, so back in right? That's where my PhD was. But I started working with biologists five years ago. And um, I think that was, that's what has to be done. Um, nobody was hiring me because I'm a good software engineer. They didn't know and they didn't care. Um, the reason I got the current job is because I spent five years acquiring domain expertise, and that's why they hired me. Right? Um, and then, once, since I had some domain expertise, I was able to build software fast. I was able to build software fast for two reasons. First of all, functional lawyer you let you do that. But second of all, I knew the problem. I understood it. And that's really what gave them confidence that I could solve their problems for them. Um, 
but on the other hand, you know, function pointing is becoming a recognized term. People kind of know about it, and we don't have to be, it's not so boring anymore. We can talk about it. There's several computational biologists who do write a lot of code, and they know the term. Um, also, programmers are just desperately needed. So the fact that they're desperate, desperately need you kind of helps, right? Um, what, they may not understand your techniques, but they need, they need some programmer, and they might as well be you. Um, one advice is be sure to distinguish software engineering from data analysis. Um, this is sort of something I always um, get confused with, um, um, I mean, my role gets confused with, is people think I know how to do data analysis. But data analysis actually implies a couple of things. It means you understand statistics, probably, and it also means you understand the domain quite well, right? You can't analyze biological data unless you really understand the biological questions being asked. Um, and uh, I'm actually a software engineer, right? So when you're trying to work with a different domain, I think that's an important distinction to make to them and make sure they know what role uh, you're actually playing. Um, and sort of as a general rule, um, I'm trying to myself discuss programming more scientifically. I try to avoid phrases like, I like OCaml. That's not the point. The point is, OCaml has polymorphic types. OCaml has first class modules. Right? OCaml has GATs now. That's the point. Um, let's discuss the technical features. And if people can't discuss the technical features with you because they don't understand it, then, then it doesn't make sense to have a conversation with them about why OCaml is better than Pro, right? Because that is the point. The point is not that I like it. So in conclusion, um, the genomic sequence core at NYU um, is running all of its computational operations on OCaml, which is uh, something I'm quite proud of. Um, the entire system was built by Sebastian Monde, who's up here in the audience also. Um, and a uh, little bit of myself. And uh, the first product version was in production within two months. And um, this is just the beginning. Biology needs a lot more computational work than uh, it's currently being done, so I think it's a great field to work in.